they capped it at, at 1350, and the, and the visa offices that I just mentioned, uh, uh, Cairo, Nairobi, uh, Pretoria, and Islamabad, all were dropped down to about 50 people each. Mm -hmm. Only 50 people out of Nairobi visa office could be new sponsorships in 2012, which has basically stayed the same for 2013, 14, and 15. Just 50 people, not 50 sponsorships, which could, have, which might have contained 150 people, but just 50 people out of Nairobi, which is the busiest visa office in the world, uh, and covers at least 12 to 15 countries alone out of that one visa office. Mm -hmm. So uh, it went up uh, in the, the numbers for this year. I think uh, are. About 1,900, so it has gone up from the 1,350, but it's up. It's still less than 2,000 for the whole country. 2,000 people that could be sponsored in 2015. New new people, new sponsorships. Mm -hmm. But those four visa offices I mentioned are still capped um, because there's still backlogs. Mm -hmm. uh, I Nest, for example, has two families in Kakuma uh, camp in uh, Kenya, who we signed the papers for in. 2009, which was what six years ago, and they have not had an interview yet. Oh, really? Wow. No interview. We have another family in, in uh, Zambia that was um, we submitted the papers for in 2008, and they finally got an interview in 2014 wow. after six years with no interview. family already, there's family here, in, or people here in, in Winnipeg who maybe have been sponsored themselves in the past. Okay. They want to sponsor more of their relatives overseas, particularly Africa. So they might come to Nest or to some other sponsoring group or directly to the SAW and ask if, if, if uh, we would be willing to sign the papers and fill out the documents or do the, the signatures um, that would allow a uh, that family to be sponsored, but once the family got here, the family here would look after them, right, okay? They would find them a place to live where they would live with them uh, until they found jobs, they would feed them, they, they, you know, all that stuff. They would do that. So those are called family linked. Okay. Now these are all private sponsorships, but under the private heading, there's family linked where the family here looks after them once they touch down. There's um, a sort of a full sponsorship, which is where Nest and, and other organizations, but Nest uh, more so than many others, uh, does fundraising to raise the funds so that when the family, type, and which and it's usually with a family overseas that does not have any relatives here. Um, well, they, they may have, but more often than not, they do not. So we raise the money for rent and food and telephone and bus passes, etc., for one year. Because all refugees that come to Canada, whether they're government sponsored or private, they get support for one year from the government or whoever the, their sponsor is, with one exception. That exception is, um, uh, they're called Joint Assistance Sponsorships, or JAS. Okay. That's where the government asks for a sponsor to step forward because they have either a family with some uh, kind of uh, medical, physical, or mental problems, or there's, it's quite a large family. And so the government will pay for that one year. In fact, sometimes it's even two years sponsorship. They'll pay the, the financial end of it. They're looking for a group to give to help them out and to assist them because they have some special needs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so the, in the past, Nest has done about 50, 50 sponsorships in the last twenty nine years. Um, it doesn't sound a lot like a lot, but it's about one hundred and seventy five people. But it takes time to raise the money because a family of four or six it takes you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars even twenty to twenty five thousand dollars that you need to raise to sponsor that family significant and all the families and and there's some people out there that think differently but all the families that come here whether they're government sponsored or privately sponsored all get the same rates for rent and food and that's the that's the the going rate for whatever social assistance Right, rates are. So it's based by province? Yes, yeah. yes. So it might be somewhat higher or lower throughout the country, but if anybody who comes to Manitoba, whether they're government sponsored or a jazz or a family linked or a full sponsorship uh, by the sponsoring group, 
they all get the same amount of money, which is the same as people on social assistance. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's emails that go around on an email on the internet or Facebook saying what, that the refugees are getting a gold, a gold plated, uh, uh, getting lots of money or whatever free you want to call it, a free ride or, yeah. or they get uh, way more benefits than senior citizens, uh, Canadian senior citizens, which is totally um, not the case. Yeah. Refugees do not uh, get anything more than social assistance. So yeah. It's not like they're getting 50000 or 100000 a year or having cars and, and you know, they, they come and they work very hard and, and, and it's a uh, level playing field. Yeah. Well, and the rates that and the people on social assistance know this as well, where the, in the social assistance rates for uh, up until not long ago for for rent were haven't been changed since the mid nineties here. Really? Wow, and it's so, and so what happens is people get and this is on social assistance and if you're a refugee, um, you get so much for rent and you get a fair bit for food. Your rent you only get this much but you need this much. So you have to take money from your food budget yeah. to augment your rent. Right. Your rent. Otherwise I mean you just can't get uh, you know, for a single person, they give three hundred dollars for rent. For rent. Wow. Yeah. Now there is some rent assist pr programs now, and they're trying to up them. And so it, it's a li it's certainly better now, but not not uh, not that long ago it was it was very very uh, difficult um, because the rate rents uh, the rates have gone up in a long time. So luckily, there you know they've got uh, everybody does all Canadians, so they're refugees on social assistance or not you have children, you get, and depending on your income, of course, and usually we're talking people with low incomes get the child tax credit. Okay. So if you have a large family, you, you have that money coming in as well, thankfully. Right. Thankfully. Yeah. In many cases, if you've got six to ten children, oh boy. Yeah. You, know, you need to, all the money you can get from whatever you're eligible for, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. You've mentioned an interview process that happened that would happen in an office like Nairobi. Yes. Where does that fit in? Okay. So you fill out the forms, and there's lots of forms um, when you start from scratch, because the government, uh, if you're doing a jazz case, or if you agreed to do a joint assistance, they've already done the interviews. They've done all the paperwork themselves. The government, they just send the family over. They tell you about them at the last second when they're getting off the plane. Um, but for a full sponsorship or a named person, where we're saying we would like. Jim Mayer to come over from Africa. You have to fill out uh, uh, an application. You have to fill out uh, another one that tells all about your life and, the wh and why and why you aren't in your country, why you had to flee, mm -hmm. etc. And you have to do that all. And on, on everybody over eighteen uh, has to do that. They can't all be on the same with their sons and daughters. But if they're over eighteen, they have to have their own separate uh, forms that you have to fill out. And so all of, all of the uh, sponsorship application forms and, and related forms are all sent here to Winnipeg mm -hmm. at the Forks. It's called the Central Processing Office of Winnipeg, or CPOW, okay. C-P-O-W. Um, it used to be uh, CIC, uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada, had regional offices across the country, but they closed some of them, and they, and uh, because before we would always send ours to the, to the Forks here, but people in Alberta would send them to Edmonton, and people in British Columbia would send theirs to Vancouver office, etc. Now they all come here. Oh. They all come to this one office. Across the country? Yeah, from all over the country. All sponsorship applications come to CPOW here in Winnipeg. And then they're sent over to the applicable visa office. So depending on, on how many staff that visa office has, and how many applications have come in over the last X number of years, and particularly 2011, the rush before the caps mm. were, were imposed. They get to them when they get to them. Depending if you're in a, in a refugee camp, uh, there again, there's two, two huge refugee camps in Kenya. The Dob camp with like 500,000 people mm. and Kakuma, which has got a couple hundred thousand people. And they're quite a ways, somewhat of a ways away from Nairobi, the capital where the visa office is. And so and the visa officers, uh, staff in Nairobi have not just Kenya to look after, uh, but uh, with those two camps, but, but also um, six or ten, twelve other countries that surround Kenya. And they have to make these trips to Zambia or to uh, Somalia or to uh, 
Uganda, Burundi, etc. And depending on when, how often they go, um, usually there was, up until not that long ago, after the uh, paperwork was processed here in Winnipeg and sent overseas, the, spons the, the principal applicant, the refugee or the head of the household, and the sponsoring group would get a letter saying, you know, your, your, your application is now in the queue, that they did, don't, uh, don't contact us for 48 months. Oh. Don't contact us for 48 months. Wow. Because that's the length, that was the average length of time out of Nairobi. Four years. Four years. Don't even contact us for four years. Wow. And then it can be longer because depending on their, how many staff they have and how often they get out to the outlying countries or to the camps. Um, and there's been some problems in Nairobi. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a couple of years ago when there was that bombing in the uh, shopping mall in Nairobi, mm -hmm. one of the people killed was one of the visa officers mm -hmm. from the Nairobi office. Mm -hmm. So there's been other security problems with Nairobi, so they don't send uh, any more families to Nairobi, just single people. I guess single ones are expendable. <laughs> I don't know what, but they don't send people with with wives or children to Nairobi anymore. Um, and they have the few, the biggest backlog of any visa office in the, in the world. Right. It's not totally safe, of course. Uh, yeah. Even the road from you know the route from uh, Nairobi to uh, Kakuman, certainly the road to Nairobi to Dob is not safe. And even the uh, UN people in both camps. Um, in fact, one of the it was the Dob camp, I think, who was heading. Was the head of the UN for them in that camp who's actually someone who's uh, originally from uh, Africa but came over to Canada before he went back to work. And he's from Winnipeg, actually. Oh, really? He's from Winnipeg. Um, but, uh, yeah, so four years, in many pl in, in four years, um, other offices like uh, Singapore, okay. it's usually three, three years or less, okay. which sounds pretty good compared to five or six. Yeah, right. But even three. You know, people are so excited when they find, particularly now, but even before the caps, people were so excited that somebody was going to sponsor them, uh, their family members, or or um, the government also puts out what they call visa office referred cases, where they've actually done, they've talked to people already and have decided they would be a good fit or would, would, might be successful in coming to Canada, and they would need us to pay for the, for the cost of them, and, and so they might come quicker, but when you ever, when any, anytime you named somebody that the visa office had never heard of mm -hmm. in one way or another, that's the, those are the ones that take the most time. Mm -hmm. They take the most time. And so we've had a number of those, of those people come to us, to our attention, usually from relatives here who can't afford to look after them themselves, right. and we have decided we would do it for them, and we sign them on the dotted line, but we also fundraise for them, and, and fortunately, unfortunately, more often than not, we've, we've had three to five years to raise that money mm -hmm. before they come because it takes so long. Right. And so once they once they get an interview, things do go much quicker. It's, it takes the length of time. It could be three, four, or five years to get that interview, and then as long as the interview goes successfully, and sometimes it doesn't, mm -hmm. and they're rejected. Um, but when they do, are, when they are approved, uh, then they and then not too distant future after that, have to get a medical. Okay. And then there's security clearance, and then they get their transportation. Uh, uh, this is set up. Is set up. Yes. So, from the time they get a, an interview to the time they fly over here is usually not, you know, maybe a year or less. Okay. It's getting that interview. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, unless you have a, a really good memory. Um, but all the forms that are filled out initially, the visa office you know, goes through all those papers that they've had for four or five or six years, and, and they like you to be able to tell exactly the same story. Right? Right, yeah. And I'm not saying anybody's lying or anything, but it's, it's hard for me. It's hard for people to remember exactly what they put on the forms, eh? and if everything doesn't match up, or if there's other inconsistencies, yeah. have another another interview. Mm -hmm. Finding out that you don't get to come, period, is bad enough. But if, but, but if you have to wait five, six, or seven years to find that out, that's just shameful. It is, yeah. It's just, it's wrong. Yeah. It's, you know, if yeah. two years would be bad enough. Yeah. Or one, you know, a year or two or three, but whatever. But even that four that they said. Yeah. You know, but yeah.
FCCI has been around for about the same length as private sponsorship has since 79, 35 years. Um, it's an advocacy group um, that has about 180 members across the country. Um, Nesta is a member, CLWR is a member, uh, Welcome Place is a member, other sponsoring groups are members all across the country um, that uh, um, do a lot of advocacy for refugees and immigrants and migrants, um, traffic women, uh, 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 and so uh, it a, has a staff in Montreal, there's a national board, uh, national executive, I'm the vice president right currently of uh, CCR, uh, having a, a consultation, national consultation coming up here in, in, uh, in Winnipeg in May, the third week of May, where people from across the country uh, will be coming and be in our different workshops and speakers. Um, yeah, we have a great staff. Uh, the executive director is just terrific. Um, she, uh, we're always uh, speaking up for and writing. She's writing articles and, and writing papers and research uh, on, on anything to do with refugees, uh, you know, particularly in the last three or four years when there's been so many changes. Um, people have refugees, can't always speak up for themselves. If they're still overseas, of course they can't. And they need someone to do that. And CCR has been the leader in Canada in doing that for 35 years. Um, and with the changes, you know, uh, particularly the health uh, health benefits, which uh, refugees had from 1957 mm -hmm. until 2012, and then they were terminated in, in June of 2012. Uh, that was um, most people. You know, they moved to say Manitoba, you get a Manitoba health card right away, so you're covered for a hospital. And, Mm -hmm. doctor's visits, but you're not covered for the dentist, mm -hmm. or eyeglasses, or drugs. And so uh, there's what was called the Interim Federal Health Benefits Package for Refugees, IFH. Only if they need it, of course. Um, many refugees don't, but there are some that do, who maybe have been in a camp, or, or some other situation for a long time, and probably haven't seen a dentist in a long time. Or maybe never had their eyes checked. Uh, or if they have glasses, they may need new prescription, or who knows what. So, in the federal government's wisdom, in '57, under Deepen Baker, said that this would be a good thing for refugees to to get this for the first year only, because mm -hmm. they don't, unless they end up working for an employer quite quickly, if they had uh, fairly good English and that employer had a benefits package, they wouldn't have these things. They wouldn't be covered for them, right? Mm -hmm. So, the interim federal health or IFH uh, program it was that's why it was established in '57 and was going great guns until 2012, when this government felt that it was too expensive. And um, uh, people are sponsored here, yeah. um, refugees, but there's other refugees that get here on their own and they file uh, their refugee claimants or asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. Somehow they've been able to make it to our border and they're let in and they have to have, to have a hearing and, and then it's determined whether they can get refugee status or not. Mm -hmm. And what the situation was when people arrived here, because Canada was such a good welcoming country, they would get some of those benefits or some health benefits right away. The government didn't like that, they didn't think that was right. So that's why they terminated the health benefits. When, they, when it was first announced in June of 2012, it was all refugees, all refugees were having their benefits terminated. And people had to say, Minister, you can't, you can't terminate the government-sponsored ones. We're the ones sponsoring them. You can't do that. Oh, and then the next thing you know, oh, uh, it's not all refugees. <laughs> the government-sponsored will still get IFH, which they have. Of course, they, I mean, that was shocking that they would cut them out, the, the people that they sponsor themselves, right? Yeah, right. Well, they, so so they, that was quickly fixed. But at the beginning, it was all refugees was cut, but now it's government sponsored. Um, got it back, and they, they still have it. Um, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers took them to court and said, you know, uh, Actually, the hospitality house here took them to court because every, every sponsorship agreement that people sign, people thought or, uh, that the agreement made reference to health care. Anyway, went to court and, and the, the, the group that uh, submitted it lost, mm -hmm. lost. But the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, C-A-R-L, Carl, submitted another appeal and won. In, and won it in July of 2014, and the ju the judge, um, I 
I can't remember all. I'll have to ref I need to re uh, refresh my memory and, and some of the things that she said there. But she she called the the government mean and uh, and a few other words that, uh, that this is just this wasn't right that they what they had done and they should uh, they were given four months to fix it to give the benefits back to the refugees. So come November, which was four months after the after the July decision, the government wanted more time. And she said no. You don't get any more time. You've got to do it now. So they did it, but they didn't do it like it was in 2012. Because all the private spon all the private sponsored people, all the family linked, all the ones that we did from 2012 until November of 14, had not were not getting those benefits anymore. Now what did happen though was most of the provinces, including Manitoba, uh, said, "Well, we'll try it in the interim, or, or we'll try and do what we can." So. They turned it over to the EIA department, the Social Assistance Department, to, to manage this. And so it took quite a while for it to, because uh, all we wanted the refugees was to get those health benefits that people in social assistance get. We didn't want any money for rent or anything else. But it took quite a while from when the minister of the provincial health minister in, in the fall of 2012 said they would pitch in. It took quite a while for that to trickle down to the frontline workers. I don't blame the frontline workers, but it took quite a while for it to trickle down because you'd go there and the, uh, the workers would say, well, you, what are you talking about? Not, you're not, you have to be on social assistance to get these. No, we said, the minister said, da-da-da-da. Mm -hmm. So that's finally worked, the kinks mostly have all worked out. So, uh, uh, but there again, that's different than IFH. IFH, Interfederal Health Penance, as soon as any kind of refugee hit the ground, they were covered. Mm -hmm. Boom classes, dental prescriptions. And that changed in 2012. So all the private ones weren't getting that anymore. Uh, and the way it works under EIA is if you're a, f a family, I'll take the example of, of the family that we had come in, in uh, December of 2013. Um, there was a mother and two children and, and then two and a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law. Um, so the mother and daughter who was under 18, they got prescription coverage right away under EIA, but had to wait three months for the other two, for dental and, and uh, eyes. Lot, eyes. Yeah. Her son, who was over 18, and her brother-in-law and sister-in-law, who were all over 18, they had to, they got coverage prescriptions right away, but they had to wait then six months. Singles had to wait six months mm -hmm. before dental and eye coverage. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is with EIA. Okay. So they had to, so, which is, I didn't really know a lot about what EI coverage was, but I do now. Yeah. So anybody that goes on the EIA or the refugees who are still under EIA coverage have to wait half of the time that they're covered as a refugee yeah, right. for six months Under for glasses and dental. Yes, not like the IFH when you when your foot touched Canadian soil, you, yeah. know, you were covered. So that's still a problem. So in, in back to November 2014, the judge said, return it like it was in June 2012. What they did is, they, for the privately sponsored ones, uh, they said, okay, for anybody under 18, you, you've got it all back. For women that are pregnant, while they're pregnant, they've got it back. But when with anybody over 18, if you're not a pregnant woman, or if you're not pregnant, all the men and any, any non-pregnant women were still not covered. Mm -hmm. And so, the Association of Refugee Lawyers are back in court mm -hmm. saying, Judge, you told them to restore it all, and they haven't. Because mm -hmm. they're still all men over 18 still don't get any of it mm -hmm. like they had before. Yes, it's good that the, anybody under 18 does. That's good. Mm -hmm. But none of the men over 18 and only the women that are pregnant mm -hmm. over 18 are getting it back. Yeah. And that's the way it is now. That's the way it is right now. So maybe after four or five or six years, um, we get notified that uh, uh, we get, um, if we're lucky, we get two weeks notice that they're coming. After five, four or five years yes. of fundraising and uh, yes. expecting. Yes, yeah. yeah, if you get a month, that's great. <laughs> so, uh, and we've had people who've called us from the airport saying we're here. Oh, wow. Which we have not been notified of, and they're at the airport. Like that hasn't happened very often, but it has happened. Because yeah. what you do is that uh, if, as soon as you know, uh, over the years, we've sort of had a, a, a stockpile of furniture 
in someone's garage. You know, uh, right now we don't. We don't. We've had many different garages, including mine, okay. store furniture over the last thirty years. Um, but a lot of people now don't have garages because they moved on to condos or apartments sure. or whatever. But it, it's just as far as furniture goes. Usually, you can put a call out to the to our member churches or to the or to the community at large, or there's places here in town now that you can, you can get free furniture. So that's really not as big a deal as it is, and it, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So we don't stockpile anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so but you have to find them a, a, a place to live. Sure. Uh, settlement agencies um, like Welcome Place downtown has a, above their offices has, uh, I don't know how many, 40 or 50 suites mm -hmm. above them. And ERCOM has a number of suites, and so of course government-sponsored ones have to, uh, don't always have a place right away either to stay, but they do have these small suites that they can stay in while they're housing people look for them, mm -hmm. a place to stay. We don't have that luxury. Okay. However, if they do have some space at Welcome Place or other places, and we're stuck, we've, we've been able to house them briefly or, or for a month or two while we look for an apartment. We have to, uh, so you meet, you go to the airport and, and, and meet them, and it's uh, particularly if uh, it's very emotional, particularly if it's family that are here as well, and they haven't seen them for many, many, many years, it's always very emotional. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've been there, to the, uh, I haven't been there all 50 times, but I've been there, ooh, I don't know how many times, I've been there, I don't know, 12, 15, 20 times, you know, um, and it's quite, uh, it's quite, emotional, um, heartwarming when you meet people uh, who've come out of a Kakuma camp or, or some other war-torn country or haven't seen family in ages and, and uh, been waiting for a long time to get their interview and finally get it and then there's the long trek, you know, two days of long flights. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, we have been lucky to, as soon as we hear, we start looking for apartments and, and depending on, the, you know, is it a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom or whatever and then we get the furniture put in and we put all the dishes and Everything, you know, bedding, towels, everything you can think of, from A to Z. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with food in the fridge, and take them there, hopefully, and, and just the first night, just let them go to sleep because they're very tired. Sure. Very, very tired. And they're always coming to establish their life here, too. So right, it's not right. like they're shipping anything. No, no. <laughs> no, no. So that's it. No, no, there's no shipping. Yeah. No, it's whatever they got is with them on the plane. Yeah, so. To a couple of trunks to just put a uh, bag, mm -hmm. one plastic bag. So yeah, and then you take them and, and uh, to their hopefully we've got an apartment that's all furnished that we front that we furnished for them and they get some sleep and you go back the next morning and then and then there's a uh, there's so many things that you have to do. Then uh, the first month or two is pretty busy. That's why you need five or six or seven people that have uh, uh, that are available at different times. You know, you must have people that are, who are still working but they're available in the evenings or on the weekends or people have that are tired, we're available during the day, mm -hmm. so it's, you need people that have been all meshed together well because um, you have to go get their, uh, start right off with matching with health cards, and get a social insurance number, and open a bank account, because uh, whether it's the government giving them a check or us giving them money, they need to have uh, a way of, uh, you know, not carrying cash around all the time, you know, sure. uh, they have to open bank accounts, etc. Appointments will be made, be made so they can their English can be assessed. Mm. Um, so if the kids are in school, they need to move off to their school age. Uh, may not have gone to school for a long time. Um, I have to get them into school, talking with the teachers and the principal, and when can they start and have their assessment of what grade they should be in. Um, start showing them, you know, going to, to the uh, grocery store, and buying food, probably some food they've never seen before. Right. Yeah. A big, a big Superstore, they may have never seen that, something like that. If they've come, if they've come out of the camp, right. um, so uh, uh, using the bus, how to get around on the bus. Um, with caregivers, depending on you know, caregivers have the you know, number of vehicles, you try and drive them around first. But you show them the bus system pretty soon and get them bus passes and stuff, you know, sure. so they can get around on their own and not rely on us. Sooner the better, but for the first month or so, it's like you know you you have to you know um, pretty pay pretty close attention to you know what they're doing, and, and uh, you might even have to show them how to use the uh, the stove, right, and yeah. the toilet, etc., yeah. the heat, uh, you know, 
things we take for granted. Oh, a lot of things we take for granted, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're starting from square one. And, and before you know it, you know, after a few months or three months or four months, or depending on the person, how much English they speak already and where, what situation they've come out of, they're just off doing their own thing and going to school and going to work and, and uh, shopping on their own and etc. cetera. But, but the first month or so was pretty hectic. Yeah. But uh, you give them a good base, good foundation, though, they'll, they'll take it from there eventually. Sure. You must never give up. Never give up. When you're in pain. Never give you up. Never up. Give when you're all alone, never give oh, up, never, never.